Thank you for tuning in to worship with us here at the Burbridge Pentecostals in Burbridge, Louisiana. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us today. Stay tuned after service for more information regarding our social media outlets and giving opportunities. We sincerely hope that today is a day of blessing, healing, and restoration in your life. Service will begin momentarily. God bless you. Well, well, it's good to be in Bro Bridge. Amen. Round, round two. I expect to be paid double this weekend. I want you to know that. <laughs> Amen. Round two. Amen. God bless you. If you just remain standing here just for a minute, uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Always an honor to be at Bro Bridge. I, I mean that. And, uh, you know, some places you go, it's not just a matter of what you're giving to them, but also that there's a return and there is um, a ministering from that congregation to you. And uh, most of the places you go, it's a, how can I say, it's kind of like a one-way street. You're there to minister to them. But when I come here, and there's uh, been a few places in my ministry that's been like this, but when I come here, it's not just a matter of ministering, but also being ministered to. And so I appreciate that very much. Uh, I did want to repeat, I'm going to preach the same message. Uh, hopefully it won't be word for word. <laughs> and all of you that were in the first session, God bless you. Amen. Just act like, oh, the Lord's already spoke this to me. <laughs> and, uh, but I did make the statement this earlier, and I want to make it again. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, was commending them. If you study it out, that church uh, had given, um, <clears throat> it had blessed him. He, early on in his ministry, they had come toward his necessity and had given to help him. And uh, he was letting them know that. He said, you know, I've been there. I've, I've been in places where I had need. I've been in places where I had abundance. But you ministered to me early on. And uh, so he was commending them for it. And then he come on down through there, and he makes the statement. But my God, shall so, well, he said, you've given, and to, the reason that you've given is that your account may abound. And then he says later, he says, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. He's decreeing that as an apostle. And he's saying, because you have done this, because you have helped in our necessity, he said, then God's going to, he's going to bless and he'll supply all of your needs. So uh, I want to tell you the, the 11 o'clock, y'all's a lazy bunch, Amen. I want to tell you the same thing I said earlier. Uh, I speak from experience of this church's blessing and uh, to our necessity and blessed us and blessed us and blessed us and supported us. And because of that, I feel to tell you, as the Apostle Paul told uh, <clears throat> that church, I feel to tell you that my God will supply all of your need because of your giving, giving to ministry, sowing seed in ministry. Amen. <laughs> My God. Amen. So, anyhow, and uh, I give honor to your pastor and his family. These are like my own kids, and uh, I love them very much. I'm not a good communicator. I don't talk a lot on the phone. Uh, I don't, um, I'm not good at texting and stuff, and I just kind of get in my world, and, and uh, <clears throat> but, you know, I love them. I maybe don't talk to them every day, <laughs> and, uh, but when it's necessary and when I'm needed or if they 
you know, we'll communicate and we'll talk a little bit. So, and, uh, but I, I want them to know, and I think they do know, Sister Morgan and I love them very much, and we love this church very much. And I appreciate your kindness to your pastor and his family and ministry. And that speaks very well. God gives you gifts. Apostolic ministry, fivefold ministries, ascension gifts. But learn to be a guardian of that gift, to protect it. And, uh, you know, somebody comes around wanting to trash a preacher or whatever. <laughs> my mom, I, I, my mom was raised in a preacher's home. And I can remember we'd moved to Anna, Illinois, and they were at a McDonald's. They were sitting there, and this lady, they were in fellowship, and this lady started in talking about her pastor. And I can still hear my mom saying, you better get up and move. I'm about to kick you off that bench. <laughs> because she had, she had seen a situation that almost destroyed my grandpa. People talking and accusing and stuff and all. So she didn't have any tolerance for it. And uh, so, and I got tickled this morning. You were talking about hurricanes and women and all that stuff. So I don't know how. Yeah. Wouldn't that? Oh, what, let, me, let me explain that so he don't. But every time they had a women's conference, a hurricane or a storm, yeah, Kendra Shock was here earlier, so. What he didn't know is my nickname for my mom. Are you ready for it? Her middle name, her, her full name, was maiden name was Joyce Willene Alf, and of course, Joyce Willene Morgan. And, and my nickname for her, which all the kids have called her, is Hurricane Willene. Because, buddy, when you provoked her, it was like a hurricane going off. Amen. So, all right, let's, uh, I'm, I'm really hungry. I'm just being honest with you. I, you know, I, I, I just got to a place I'm kind of carnal. <laughs> and, you know, I've been in so many church services, and they linger, and they just keep going, and they just keep going. And I'm like, okay, I've had a million of these services. I'm hungry. Can we just go eat? <laughs> well, I'm being honest with you. Amen. And, uh, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll see what the Lord wants to do here. Amen. And hopefully the same spirit that moved in earlier will. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 4. And um, uh, verse 4, and, but when the fullness of the time came, the time came, was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Look at the term, because I've quoted this many times with the fullness of time, but it says when the fullness of the time, the time came. God sent forth his son made of a woman. I want to talk to you today about the intersection of time and seasons. The intersection of time and seasons. Now, I, I preached this earlier, and then I got ready to leave, and what was the name, Brother uh, Blank, Blanchard? Come up and said, I was reading down through there, and he, he gave me another little insight to the story, so... You're going to get that when they didn't. Is that fair enough? And so, so you're going to get a little extra here today. And if we hurry up through this, we'll really get a little extra. <laughs> Amen. I love you. Lord, thank you for this church, the leadership of this church. I pray that your favor and blessing will remain upon it. I ask you that you would help me with clarity of mind and thought and to move into that flow of your anointing, to minister out of Christ's light spirit, confirm your word, and take authority of this service in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, you could be seated. God bless you. And all the ministers that are here today, God, God bless you. And uh, amen. I appreciate all ministry. And uh, uh, I, I really do. Um. You're a good man. You have a pure spirit. You have a pure spirit. Don't ever be afraid to say what God told you to say to whoever he tells you to say it to because it comes out of purity. There's no agenda. There's no hidden motive. It's just from him to them. And you're the conduit. Amen. He'll tell you that. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> several years ago, I, this, this, this is off. Several years ago, um, I was preaching for Brother David Shatwell. This has this been back probably 88, 89, somewhere through there. And uh, I was in prayer. I was in the sanctuary in Okmulgee. And uh, I was in prayer. And uh, I could take you to the spot to this day. I was, if, you, if the pulpit would be here, I was, I was right in this vicinity in that building. When the presence of God moved so tremendously, it moved in. And, uh, wow. And I was in the floor. And I was kind of bent over, my face buried in the carpet. And I heard the, I heard the Holy Ghost speak to me about, in the end time, you will stand before and when God told me who I would stand before to speak his word, it was overwhelming. Tremendously overwhelming. And uh, I, I was just like, oh, my Lord. Hey, that can't be from you, God. I was born in southeast Missouri, a little town called Kennett. It's a farming community. Cotton fields. I have a preserved cotton stalk in my office to remind me of my origin. And, uh, <clears throat> but I began to reason with God. Seriously. I'll stand before these in the end time and speak your word. And, uh, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. And uh, then he said, but you remember in that day that Moses was not in the court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was in my court. Because the man of God walked in and said, Thus saith the Lord. I guess I grieved him because I just still couldn't believe. And the Lord spoke and said, As a sign to you that this will come to pass, I want you to know that I will visit this area not many days hence with massive death and destruction. That was on a Monday. I preached Monday night at the close. I don't know some of you have heard this. At the close of the service, as a man there, I wrote it in the front of his Bible. I didn't tell him the first part. Like I kept parts from you. But I wrote in the front of his Bible, or he wrote it. I will visit this area in not many days since with massive death and destruction. We dated and signed at April whatever at 9.10 p.m. The next morning at 8 something in the morning, Timothy McVeigh backed that truck up 
and a bomb went off and sent 157 or 158 people into eternity. I have a picture of the devastation on my phone. Ever so often when I have questions and a little doubt about, like, you better hurry up, God. <laughs> I'm reminded, and when the enemy starts coming back to me to remind me of you're not qualified or you're not certain caliber and you couldn't stand in these places, I look at that picture and I'm reminded. I've often felt that it dealt with Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Um, Lynn McDonald called me last week. Maybe talked to Lynn a couple times in years. He started talking to me about Pharaoh and how that uh, the people of God, see, you're already getting something totally different. <laughs> the people of God were, or when the famine came to Egypt, and they said, okay, you can purchase it. So they got all their money. And then the next year they come back when he bred again, and we'll give us your cattle. And they took it, and then they come back, give us your land. Pharaoh will own all of it. But in that, it said, but he did not take the priest land. He didn't get it. Pharaoh didn't get it. Mm. And I said, Lynn, you know, and it all started kind of making sense. I said, you know, Lynn, they was in a famine, pestilence. It drove them to this. And I said, now everybody has to turn to Pharaoh, has to turn to the government to meet their necessities, except the priest, Goshen. This was the origin of it. Couldn't take that. And then it dawned on me. We are swiftly moving through pandemic situations, pestilences. You know, living in California is almost like being in Egypt. Seriously. And I, I, I ministered here a while back online. I said, you know, maybe we ought to wake up pestilences, pandemics, fires. It's right out of the book of Genesis or Exodus. It's just, it's crazy stuff. But the deal is it dawned on me that this is where it's trying to go. It's trying to go to where Pharaoh will have to provide and Pharaoh will have to give. You're still waiting on another stimulus check, aren't you? It'll be your wealth, it'll be your cattle, it'll be your land. And then we look to Pharaoh, but it's in that day, he said, you remember. When you speak my word, you remember. And this thing is about to move into a place to where there'll be prophecies and there'll be Old Testament-like prophets that arise that are going to speak to kings and kingdoms and nations and all. It won't be this stuff just prophesying in the services. I want you to listen to me right now. It's going to be where God raises up people that will stand before rulers and stand before nations and go into the court of Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let God's people go and it doesn't matter what your background is it doesn't matter what your education is it doesn't matter where you come from and how insignificant you feel we've got to remember in that day we are not standing in the court of our nation or our land but God has brought them into his court Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. 
This thing is moving, moving quickly. It's moving toward true apostolic dimensions. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but my God, we've been practicing on each other long enough. This thing is getting ready to be where people stand before the governors and they stand before the mayors and they stand before the legislation and all the crazy neo-Pentecostalism and all the stuff that's been trying to minister to the president and everybody else. I got news for you. It's, it's moving real quickly right now. We are coming to the intersection. We are coming to the intersection of time and seasons. Quickly moving toward it. Woo. When the fullness of the time. Now let me hasten into it, all right? Paul's talking about sonship. Talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ. He talks about sonship and immaturity and sonship. And as long as you're immature, you differ no more than a servant which is one of the plagues of the North American church as people stay in spiritual infancy. Still have to have a pacifier. Still got to have the preacher saying, Gucci, Gucci, Goo. If you don't shake my hand, you don't visit me, you don't talk to me, I'm offended. Well, the Bible says a righteous man is not easily offended. If you're always been offended, you might want to look at your righteousness. That one stung just a little bit. I've met people like that constantly. I'm just, you offended me. Well, what did I do this time? I had a man snap at me one time, and you said you'd do this, this, and this, and all. And buddy, he made a bad mistake while I was trying to get around him. And he grabbed my arm and tried to spin me around so he could tell me this. I don't know if it was God or anger. I have a, both. I have a hard time. It was righteous indignation. I have a hard time sometimes differentiating between the two. I snapped. I said, don't you ever, ever grab me like that again. If I told you I'd do that, I will. He's always offended about something. Always, I need to talk to you. He's probably watching right now. No, you don't need to talk to me. You need to grow up. Talk to God. Quit talking to me. You want, you, you want me to talk to God for you? Kind of like Moses, I would have got everybody was a prophet. It'd make my job a whole lot easier. But it's in the spiritual immaturity and, and all the stuff. They differ no more than servants. The servants have to have rules and on and on. And this goes. I want to get into that right now. So he's, he's dealing with this. But when he says, but when the fullness of the time came, uh, there's there's... Three Greek words for time, and I have to write this stuff down because my memory's not as good as it used to be. One is chronos. It means years or space of time. The other is kairos. It means a set or proper time, due season. It's a due season. It means something specific about this time. Then there's another one, that uh, aeon, which means where you get the word age. Uh, when it talks about... Uh, over in Hebrews, uh, by, by faith we know that the worlds were framed. The word worlds there does not mean cosmos. It literally means ages. And the book of Hebrews, when it deals with this, it's showing you, we call it the Faith's Hall of Fame. It's showing you men that lived in a certain age that they seem completed in that age what God had spoke. It's not cosmos. It doesn't mean this world, but it means ages. And then it gives you the list of men that lived in particular ages that finished, completed by faith. Now, here's the difference. A lot of those people only got a word. That's it, one time. 
They didn't have an apostolic church service for every time they came. Somebody needed to confirm it. I think sometimes we get prophetically intoxicated. They got a word. That was it. They just went on and did. They finished. They completed. They framed whatever it was. That means to complete. They framed it, but simply by a word from God. But when it says, when the fullness of the time came, and the word fullness is intriguing to me because basically one of the main definitions of it, it first of all, it means to satisfy, to finish, to be complete. And then this one got my attention, to fully preach. So in other words, they preached and they preached and they preached and they preached. Now the subject that Paul's dealing with, the sonship, is dealing with the revelation of Jesus Christ. God sent forth his son. So you go back to the Old Testament, you have the prophets. Isaiah especially called the prophet of redemption. He prophesies about the coming Messiah. He was a favorite for them to quote in the synagogues, but they just kept preaching it and they kept prophesying it. They kept talking about it. They kept echoing it. They preached it. They prophesied. They just kept doing it until they had fully preached it. And they had come to the moment that it was no longer just Logos or Arima, but it had become a reality. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Now, I've mentioned this earlier today. Let me give you a little oneness. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Y'all remember that one? Word there, the word word is logos. In the beginning was the logos. The logos was with God, and the logos was God. So basically, the Gnostics and the Greeks taught very simple. They taught thinker and thought. If you have a thought, you have to have a thinker. And if you got a thinker, you're going to have a thought. And so that's where they stop. Okay, you got God's out here, Logos. I said it this morning earlier, I'll say it again, that basically the way they taught and believed is you're not really real here today. A God somewhere is just thinking this. It's just a thought in some God's it's not a reality. It's surreal. It's just a God thinking all this. So, you know, when you mashed your finger in the door the other day, it was a sadistic God just thinking. That wasn't real pain that went through your body. <laughs> so if that's the case, I guess it's okay to say the words that come to your mind. Because that's not really you doing that. That's a God somewhere. <laughs> I got your attention on that one, didn't I? Glorified cuss words. <laughs> but here's where John differed. Here's where John took a little further. In other words, John said, and the word, the logos, became flesh. Flesh means thing. The angel that proclaimed to Mary, that which is born in you is it's going to be a holy thing. Everybody say thing. Mm. A holy thing. Now, <clears throat> You got to remember to every thing there is a season. There's a season. So you have seasons, and in those seasons are particular things that are supposed to happen. And I'm basically kind of teaching right here. There's things that are supposed to happen. This is the season for it to happen. I mean, I've used this illustration for years. It just makes a good one. Matter of fact, I used it the other day in Arkansas, and after service, a lady walked up and handed me a bag of apples. <laughs> Because my illustration was, is if there's no markets, there's no grocery stores, there's no Walmart grocery store, none of that stuff, and you want apples because you like apples, uh, <clears throat> then you have to go to the apple orchard to get them. So we know what the thing is. The thing is apples. But it doesn't matter if you go there in May or even June with all the faith that you can muster saying, I speak apples. Come forth. It's not going to happen. Not unless God's got a little different plan for you. It's not going to happen. And if you go in November, you may get the apples, but they're not fit to eat. They're on the ground and they're rotted fruit. 
because there is a particular season for apples to come into season and the thing that you want is apples. So the devil doesn't care how early you are and he doesn't care how late you are. What he doesn't want is for you to come to the intersection of time because the time has moved you now to a particular season and in that season there's some thing that is supposed to happen. Yeah. So early lady doesn't care. What he doesn't want is for you to be on time. For you to understand the time of this. Another example. Boy, y'all are getting a whole different version. Another example is, is, is you know, Christ ascends into the heavens and, the, and they're just sitting there gazing. This is usually what we do with prophecies. Are you hearing me? Gazing. This is the place of inspiration. This is the place where he spoke it. Go tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power. And the angel said, why well, stand you here gazing? Because that's usually what we do with prophecies. We gaze. Why stand you here gazing? Paraphrase. Where did he tell you it was going to happen? Jerusalem. Where are you standing, Bethany? Hint. You might want to start moving with time to get to the right place. Because the thing that's going to happen is the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out, whether there's 500 of you, 5,000, 5 million, or 5, on the day of Pentecost, there's a thing that's going to happen in the season called Pentecost. Mm. Now, if you'll look at the graphic up here, you'll see the word time, and there's in the middle of that little, there's an arrow. So time is horizontal, and it keeps moving. I found out this morning that this man has a really bad past. <laughs> he confessed to knowing an old rock song. I was just operating in the gift of the Spirit. I didn't even know it had existed. <laughs> there used to be a song that said, time keeps on slipping, slipping or something into the future. I know none of you know what I'm talking about right now. And there's a lot of reality to that song. You can't stop time. If you do, you're dead. You can't stop time. It just keeps moving. Whether you want it to or not, it keeps moving. And time keeps moving you from one season to another season to another season. But what we need to understand, what is the thing that is supposed to happen in this season? What's the thing supposed to be happening in the season of my life? I used this illustration a little earlier. I'll use it again. I mean, if you're 70, quit trying to look like you're 20. That's not the season. I don't care how much facelifts and hair transplants and everything that you do because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make, ooh, you're trying to make a season in your life something that's permanent. That you, you, you're there and you don't want to change this. And that's, that's where a lot of us are right now with where America is and our society is and where we have been. We just want, you know, boy, we had it good over here. We want to stay right here. We don't want nothing to change. And we're trying to go back over here to a past season. And God's saying, ah. Mm. No, 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 no. You're trying to get locked into a season, that this season is eternal. But it's not eternal, it's temporary. If you notice, I put over here season. There's two vertical lines, which is the beginning of that time that moves you into a season and the end of it. There's a segment of time in there. Time, oh, time just moves through all of it, but there's a segment in there that God said, this is a season, and in this season, this is the thing that's supposed to happen. So in this season, it's been prophesied, it's been preached, but when the fullness of the time came, yeah. 
Christ was born of a woman. So we preach it, we prophesy it, we echo it, we keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Well, you preachers keep saying the same thing. You keep prophesying the same thing. We're going to keep doing it. We keep doing it, keep doing it. Because along with that, time is moving us toward it no longer just been logos or rima, but time is moving us to where it becomes a reality and it becomes a thing. Now, are you ready for this one? All things work together for the good. You could also say all the seasons in your life and the things that happen, they're working for your good. Are you with me? So now we come to this. Jacob. Jacob is running in fear of his life. The Bible says, and he lied upon a certain place. Where is it? Genesis chapter, or is it 28 or 38? 28? Genesis 28. He lighted upon a certain place. He took stones of that place, used them to make a pillow out of it. In that place, I said, in that place he made. He took stones of that place, and in that place he did this. Three times in the first verse it mentions place. He does it. The place was Abraham's first and original altar. Abram is his name then. He comes into the land of Canaan. This later would become Bethel. And he builds an altar right there, and he sacrifices. And this was the beginning of the covenants. Jacob had heard those stories. He had heard the stories. But to him, it's just a story. But when he finally, with time, got to that place, God said, I'm going to teach you something here. And he goes to sleep, and in the, in the sleep, he has a dream. And in the dream, a ladder comes down. Well, the ladder is not a, 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 a construction-type ladder, but it's a staircase. And so you have... Two sides to the staircase. You have the beginning of it. You have the end of it. Don't go either way too far. But it's not this. It, it's like a staircase. It does this. And all of that I could teach and I'm not going to about. It's different levels of glory. And you go from glory to glory to glory until finally you get to the top of the ladder and it's glorification. So the deal is, is when you watch all that happen, and Jacob, he wakes up and he says, he's seen angels ascending and descending there, and he said, surely the Lord was in this, and I knew it not. This is none other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. So he's proclaiming to them right there. This is a very sacred place, and the reason why it's a sacred place that God dwells in is because, and there's a ladder here, is because it's a place of sacrifice. There's an altar here. Now, if you want to find God, find an altar. If you, want, if, you, if you want the fire to fall, an altar. And I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I may have said it here before, but I've always associated prayer as the altar. And finally here a few months ago, God said, no, that's not true. You can have prayer but not have an altar. You can't have an altar and not have prayer, but you can have prayer and not have an altar. The altar is not a place of prayer. The altar is a place of death. And there's a lot of people praying, but they ain't dead. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Come on back to the altar. I asked Dr. Hughes, I said, what, what's, what is about that living sacrifice? He says, real simple. Well, good, I understand it then. He said, in the Old Testament, when you slew the animal and put it on the altar, it couldn't crawl off. But you can. And he said, so daily, you've got to go back, put yourself on the altar. Daily, go back and put yourself on the altar. Go back daily. If you're going to do the will, boy, I'm, I'm on something right now. If you're going to do the will of God, 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable to do this. It's your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You will never know what the will of God is until you get an altar and you die on that altar to where it's not what you think and what you want. But now your mind is renewed. See, you got your way of thinking. I've said this a hundred thousand times, it seems like. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus Christ died in the garden. He died when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, here's my real cross. Here's my real altar. This is where I die out. But nonetheless, not my will, but thine be done. And Jesus in the, in the Lord's prayer told you, let your will be done in earth even as it is in heaven. You know how you do that? You get rid of your own will. You get rid of your own thinking. You get rid of your own way of thought until your mind is renewed and God can speak to you in that moment what his perfect, good, and acceptable will is and then you're to go perform it and go do it. Hallelujah. I just wish I knew what the will of God was. Go build you an altar. Quit waiting on somebody else to tell you what the will of God is. Go build you an altar. Submit your ideas. Submit your will. Submit your life. Submit your ways to him at that altar and learn how to pray the same prayer that Jesus did. Nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I don't want to do this. My flesh is struggling against this. But if this is the will of God, I'd die right here. Woo! This and my life is the intersection of time and a season. Woo. We come to that moment. You don't have a choice. It just keeps moving. Time keeps on moving. You can't stop it. It's headed toward things. All of these, they're seasons. If you looked into the spirit realm, boy, I feel, if you look into the spirit realm, you see time moving like this, and then you see those segments. It's all through time. Segments, it's eternal. Those things, it's vertical. It comes from the heavens. Time, the horizontal, is earthly. The vertical is heavenly. That's why he said, let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's when the earth and the heavens come together that you have an intersection. And you're going to learn in your life that there are those intersections that have already been predetermined by God. He knew the thing that was supposed to happen there. Him and his eternal realm. He forever lives through time. And he forever lives through eternity. And he's already put seasons in your life. And he put those vertical lines there. And he said, this is coming out of the heavens. This is the gate of heaven. And it's coming towards you. There's something that I want to do in this season in your life. It's already been decreed. It's already been declared. And time is moving you toward it. And if God made you a promise until it becomes a reality, you just keep prophesying it and keep preaching it and keep quoting it and keep saying it. And Paul tells Timothy, he said, Now in concern to the prophecies that went before on thee, that by them you might war a good warfare. See, the enemy wants to get you so frustrated and so vexed and so weary with life that you forget, you forget the thing that God told you would happen because when he spoke it to you in that moment, you thought it should have happened right then and God said, no, it's already done in that season. But you got to allow time to move you. And don't get distracted and don't get frustrated and don't get bitter toward me because you didn't get there overnight. Just keep moving toward it. You keep prophesying it. You keep saying it. You keep quoting it. You keep remembering it. And you war for it. I'm not going to let anything or anybody, I'm not going to let a devil take the thing that God wants to do in my life. I will not miss my season. Hallelujah! Woo! 
Now, now listen, listen. All things, all seasons work together. The problem with us is we get so used to this is the way that God did it in this season that we have a hard time transitioning to a new season and a new way of doing things. The pandemic has tried to move us into that. Who would have thought this time last year that you'd be down to two services, streaming, and sometimes not even allowed in the building, you have to stream, and we're cursing it out. Oh, my God, the devil. God. You need to be careful what you're calling the devil. Because God says that was a season. You had a season for that over here. America, you had a season for that over there, but you've moved past that season. And you're headed to another season. But you want to go back to the old season and you want to go back to the old way of doing things and you want to go back to your comfort and you want to make that season permanent in your life, but it's not permanent. Woo! Now I'm into it right now. God told David, he said, through the prophet, he goes to the thing, he says, I want you to pray. I want you to pray, and I, I want to I want to build God a house. And the old prophet said, "Build God a house." And that night, God spoke to the prophet, said, "I didn't tell you to tell him that. Now you go back and tell David this. I didn't ask you to build me a house. I didn't ask you to build me a house. You show me anywhere I spoke to the prophets or the judges to build me a house. That's what you want to do. So you're not going to do it." David, I have lived in the tents, and I have gone from tent to tent, and from tabernacle to tabernacle. I've gone from the tabernacle of Moses to the tabernacle of David. I've gone from this tent to another tent. But you want to make it permanent. You want to make it stationary. I'm not asking you to build me something that's stationary. I'm asking you to have the ability to go from tent to tent, from season to season. Don't make this season permanent because nothing is permanent. He looked toward the temple. See, you got to make up your mind. Are we going to build a tent or are we going to build a temple? Are we going to have a tabernacle or are we going to have a temple? Jesus Christ was not called the temple of God on this earth. He said the tabernacle of God is always with man. And the word became flesh. Tabernacle is what it means. It tabernacled itself. The word tabernacled itself. And Jesus Christ was always in movement because temples are stationary. You'll finally get the temple when you get to the new Jerusalem. But until you get there, you're a tabernacle. You're a tent. And God always intended for the tent to be able to be moved. And it goes from tent to tent and from tabernacle to tabernacle. And we're trying our best to make our culture and make our methods and the way we've always done church. We want to make it permanent. God said, no, no. It'll be permanent once you get to the new Jerusalem. But until you get there, you better learn how to go from season to season and from tent to tent and from tabernacle to tabernacle. <clears throat> If you think for one minute that God's going to let us go back to business as usual after the pandemic hitting us. And oh, we finally started coming out in the state of California. And we had a few church services. And guess what? We started right back in the same ruts, right back in the same thing. And the Lord said, you think I'm going to waste this? <clears throat> I'm trying to move you from the mount of the law. Better sit down. I'm going to shake you up a little more. <clears throat> Where are you going, Elijah? Running in fear of your life. You're weary. i got to feed you supernaturally. And finally, he gets to the place. And he gets to a cave. And he's hiding in that cave. And God said, what doest thou here? In other words, tell me your location. You don't think God knew where he was at? What he's saying is, I want you. Same thing that he said to Adam. Where art thou, Adam? He knew where Adam was. 
He's wanting Adam to take inventory and identify, this is my spiritual place right here. This is where I'm at right now. What doest thou here, Elijah? I'm going to visit you. And so the Bible says, earthquake, the wind and the fire, but God was not in it. <clears throat> God was not in it. And then the next thing is, still, small. Why the wind, the earthquake, and the fire? You ready? The same cave that Elijah's hiding in is the cleft in the rock that God hid Moses in when he calls his glory to pass by and he gives Moses the law. And the way that God moved with Moses in the establishing of the law was with the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. Elijah, that's how I manifested myself then when I gave the law. But I'm not here to represent the law. I'm here to represent the prophets now. And I'm not going to move in this season the way that I moved in that season. And you people are so used to wind, earthquake, and fire, especially in your Pentecostal church service, that that's the way you think God's got to move. But I'm going to put you in a cave We're going to call it shelter in place. Well, we just want to go back to the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. And God said, no, 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 no. I already moved that away. It's a new season. And we're so used to having to have a church service to keep us praying through and to keep us in tune with God. Now God says, nope. You're going to learn my still, small voice. It's going to be about me and you. And I'm going to speak to you in this still small voice. And I'm about to tell you in this season right now, the thing that I'm going to do. Now I've got you in this cave. I've got you isolated. I got you away from the crowd. There's no wind. There's no earthquake. There's no fire. Here's what I'm about to do. You go anoint Jehu to be king. You find Elisha. He'll fill your room. Yeah, and I want you to go anoint a double portion generation. This is the season that we're in. Whew. This is the time. We're trying to be stuck. We're trying to be in something that's permanent. And God says, no, there is no permanent season till you get to the eternal. You've got to learn to go and allow this comprehension all things, all seasons. They, I keep going from one to the other. Am I making any kind of sense here? <clears throat> Need to understand that. Lost my job. What did you ever think God's trying to take you from one season to another? Everything's crazy right now. It's crazy everywhere. We're cursing it and Blasting and rebuking it. God uses some very unique situations to move you. And the North American church had become comfortable. It was spiritually asleep. Yeah. See, you're spoiled. You really are. You're spoiled, you have a move of God, you have a spiritual hunger, you're never satisfied. I mean, you just keep, well, I hate to tell you this, but 99% of our churches aren't that away. They're very traditional, very content, a few songs, a little sermonette for Christianettes. Just challenge them preach a little inspirational something to them. I've been in places where they said you shouldn't preach over 20 to 40 minutes. Well, you're too late for that one. <laughs> you can't hold their attention any longer than 40 minutes. You may tell you why we can't hold their attention any longer than 40 minutes because you're so full of watching movies for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and sports and all that stuff that you've started filling up on Hostess Cupcakes. 
And we got to have something dramatic and something theatrical just to keep your attention. You got to have something moving constantly just to keep your attention because that's your diet now. That's your diet now. Fill up on hostess cupcakes and Twinkies and whatever else and yellow cake with chocolate ice and cold glasses of milk. And then you come to the house of God and it's not cake and it's not milkshakes and all this stuff and all. It's, just, it's manna, it's bread. And you're like, ugh, ugh. We want meat. We want carnality. Meat's carnal, it's carnivorous. We want carnal things. Feed us with carnal things. We're tired of the bread. We disdain this bread. So we don't want you to cook us bread. We want you to cook us a nice dessert or something that's sweet to the taste. Mm. This is where we've been. And the church has been in this little comfort place and all. And you were watching all this stuff happen. And we become seeker friendly and whatever. And, you know, well, we got to be careful because we got visitors that are coming. And I didn't know our church service was to be solely ordained around visitors. No, 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 no. I'm not giving us a license to get up and get abusive or whatever. But the book of Acts, their church service was not evangelistic by nature. Their lifestyle was evangelistic by nature. When they come to the house of God, it was to edify, to... Boy, I lost a whole bunch of you right there. I got to hurry. It's kind of where we've been. Then God said, it's time for you to wake up. I'm going to shake you out of this season into the next one. And boy, we're going kicking and fighting and resisting. And I just, I just wish this thing would hurry up and pass so we could go back to the old economy. And we could go back to this and we could go back to business as usual. And that ain't going to happen. I hate face masks. I just want to use a Bible word, damask us. My God, we've been spitting on each other for years. <laughs> now they're talking about it. It just may become a part of our reality. It may become a new norm. I See, that's our problem. God busts us out of an old norm into a new norm, but we don't like the new norm. We want to go back to the old norm, and God says, it's not the season. I don't know if I'm making sense or just making people mad. I'm not quite sure. You're just happy with the old season. Kind of got secure there. Enjoy it. But the problem is what you can't see is it's a season. There's a beginning and an end. And time just keeps moving you through it. And you're kicking trying to reach back. You don't want to do that. That means you're dead. And you'll spiritually die. If you think you can stop at one season and hold on to it and make it permanent, you'll die right there. When time ceases in your life, it's called deceased. You're dead. And the same thing happens to you spiritually when you will not allow God to move you from glory to glory and you decide time doesn't work for me anymore. I'm going to stay right here. Then you become spiritually dead at that place. I used to get tired of hearing this, but it's real. God's going to do a new thing. I heard that so much. I'm like, oh, I get sick of hearing that. But here we are, a new thing. Oh, we want God to do a new thing. We want God to keep doing the old thing. <laughs> We're comfortable there. That's predictable. We feel safe there. We figured all that out. And God said, And we're at that intersection. <laughs> the question is, what is the thing that God's wanting to do? I'll close with this. And that don't mean I'm going to close. 
but I'm just throwing you out a little bone, throwing you out a little hope here. You may hear that several times. No, not the first one. The Apostle Paul would use it. He'd write a little bit, and then he'd say, finally, brethren. Then he'd write a little more and say, finally, brethren. I think we have a long church. Paul was preaching about three hours one time. A guy fell out of the windows. He just kept saying, finally, brethren, finally, brethren. <laughs> finally. Angels ascending and descending. And I'm not going to go into this a whole lot. We have to determine what season we're in. And what angel ascends into that season to do what he does and to allow the other angels that's not their season to ascend. Am I making sense? So when we move to particular seasons, there is an angel that descends into that because that's what's necessary, that's what's needed. The others that are not necessary, they ascend. But see, we want to hold on to the Angels that have descended and stay there and hold on to those. Now, I'm, I'm, I know where I'm going right now. We're going to stay there and hold on to that angel. And he's saying, you got to let me go. There's another one coming. Embrace him. But let me go. <laughs> and so, Sister Gwen Porsche called me. A year ago, I started talking about um, she was in Alamogordo, New Mexico, pre or ministering and also in a time of prayer with another lady there, been involved in my prayer deal for many years, Sister Paula. And uh, this goes back to Rick Martin when he was in Alamogordo and America on Fire. And that was where I, God has spoke to me two or three times and said, you, you're, now, don't, just hear me out. I said this one time at our home church and on. I had a young man get offended and, you know, he's trying to be like a televangelist or whatever. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm trying to do. I'm an internet evangelist. <laughs> the master of the web. But God has spoke to me about a plane. I was preaching there. On Sunday morning, and uh, this lady walks up and handed me, it's either 17 or $27. Just handed it to me. I, so I said, she said, the Lord told me to give that to you. It's, it's a help on the plane that he told you about. And so I've had others, you know, in the end time, you'll get weary from commercial traveling. There, done it, got the T-shirt. And uh, I got millions of miles on planes. Thank you for flying me out first class. I will not get you in trouble here, but thank you. My backside thanks you. <laughs> I don't know. Stuff just comes to my mind. I just need to stay off of it, but... talked to an associate pastor one time, and he said, look, I just want to talk to you about something. I said, what? He said, um, I was told that you fly first class. And I said, yeah. He said, well, it don't matter if you like it or not. I'm the one flying. And so I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm just going to ask you. I want to talk to you. He said, how can you justify that with churches when you could be flying economy? I said, yeah. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> well, I drive a Lexus. Well, why do you drive a Lexus? You could be driving a net more economical car, a lot smaller car. Why do you have to have that? Well, he said, well, I travel a lot in my car, and I'm visiting the saints, I'm doing this and all, and it's a little more comfortable. I said, but, but how do you justify that with your church 
that you can drive a Lexus and you could be driving a Ford Pinto. That's, they don't make, what's another small economical? A Honda Accord, no, Honda Civic. Honda Accord's too big. Honda Civic. If you drive a Civic, I'm not knocking them. I like them. He said, I don't know. I never thought of that. I said, see, you drive that car because it's more comfortable. It's, it's dependable. And I said, I don't travel in cars. I said, I drive at that time. I said, I drive a Honda Element. $22,000 Honda Element. But I'm not in my car that much. I'm on a plane. Just as you're in your car, I'm on a plane. And so I can justify this like you could justify that nice Lexus you're driving in. He said, boy, I never thought of that. So before you go criticizing me, what kind of car did you drive up in here today? Boy, that, I don't know where that come from. It just kind of. Now, what was I talking about before that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Like, brother, you ain't told a guy one time. He said, you ain't thinking, right? So I'm going to do your thinking for you. I appreciate you doing my thinking for me. <laughs> so we're, she, she's there, and they go into a prayer meeting. And in the prayer meeting, she talked about how that an angel of the Lord came in. And she said, no, Brother Morgan, we've been in services to where we've known that Michael was present. And I don't want to go into all that as I did earlier. Uh, Michael was present, and we've been there. It was in the Philippines, and this warring angel. Now, hear me. You have to learn which angel has descended, and it's for that season, and then when it's time for him to ascend and others to descend. Are you all listening to me? Yes, Michael is the angel of war as far as I'm concerned. He wars. Now, I want you to hear me, and I don't want to do anything to hinder or to stop this church. But you cannot stay in a perpetual state of spiritual warfare. God never intended for it. There's a season to go to war. David, your job is to go to war and to back the enemy so far that the next season, which will be your descendant, Solomon, he won't have to war, he'll build. So there's an angel that comes for war, and there's an angel that comes for build, or a better word for us would be harvest. And we have to know what season that we're in, and we're coming to the intersection. Now, we're leaving one season. It's been a season of spiritual warfare. Warring, 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 warring. And that's the season. That's been the season. But now we're transitioning and we're moving to a new season. So she said, Brother Morgan, she said, I, you know, we, we've been to services, you know, her and I in Eastwood and other places, that Michael appeared, Manila, he appeared, the whole deal. But she said, this was a different one. And she said, he was so powerful but she said, you were almost afraid to move. It wasn't out of fear, it was out of reverence. And she said, it was just overwhelming. And she said, we just in there just worshiping God and just said that thing was there. And she said, I finally moved into another room and I said, God, who is this? And at that moment, the lady in the other room, Sister Paula, starts going this. It's an angel of the Lord that's sent to lead God's people into a prepared place. And so Sister Gwen, true to her nature, she goes to the scripture and she went to Exodus. Now I'm going to lead you into the land of promise. This is a prepared place. There are things that I have prepared to happen in this place. And he's to help you get there and to help you receive it. Am I making sense now? It's his responsibility. My name will be in him. My authority will be in him. Your enemies will be his enemies. But don't provoke him. Now your pastor told me after a while ago about this angel. He looked at the word provoke. It means bitterness. 
And he, he was sharing with me, and I think he might have just preached it. Now, we didn't know all that, but about how that bitterness is how that you can provoke this angel. And it's not just bitterness, but it's unbelief. Go read the word provoke in Psalm 78. How many times he said, you provoked him, you provoked him, you provoked him. And you limited the Holy One of Israel. The book of Hebrews says, calls it the day of provocation. This is where you provoke God to anger. Because you limited him. You said that your little ones would fall prey in that land. You forgot what he did in Egypt. You forgot what he did here. You forgot all of his provisions. And now you're saying this because here's a new season. Here's a new place. And all you can see is the problems that are there. And because of that, you've limited him. And your unbelief has caused you to miss it. And one generation entirely misses the season. And God has to take them through their season. And for 40 years, he has to lead them around until they all die in the wilderness. And God brings in a different generation because of their unbelief and their bitterness toward God. Yeah. And this is where we're at. She said, Brother Morgan, I feel to tell you in the Holy Ghost, that angel is coming. She said, he's coming towards you right now. She said, he's coming, and his purpose is, is to take you into the things that God has prepared, the promises that God has prepared for you. So what I'm here today to tell you is, is Bro Bridge, there's not a church that I know of that can get into spiritual warfare any quicker than you can. That's your true gift. But this angel that's here now, he's not here for war. Oh, you're going to keep praying. Don't provoke him. Don't start warring. Don't start going after us. I wanted to use the word whoring. Don't start whoring after other gods. Don't start worshiping their gods. Don't try to look like the Canaanites and act like the Canaanites and talk like the Canaanites and start their stupid pagan practices. Don't, this irrelevant nonsense that you've got to be relative to them. You've got to be like them, act like them, talk like them to win them. That's a bunch of nonsense. Nonsense. You're going to provoke him if you do these things. I've looked in the scripture and I get to the book of Revelation. And I'm, I'm close with this. I get to the book of Revelation and I see constantly a mention of angels with a sickle. So some angels come with a sword and some come with a sickle. And you have to learn by wisdom to know what season is it in your life? Is it time for me to war for my prophecies or is it time for my prophecies and my harvest? Don't be weary in well-doing for in... Do what? You shall... You don't get weary. You know what the word weary means there? Well, there's another one that says faint, the word faint. It, it don't mean lose consciousness. It means to relax. You don't relax. Okay, I'm just going to wait on God. No, you keep moving with God. You keep warring for your prophecies. But then you have to have discernment to know, okay, this is all changing now. Now it's time for this to become a reality. And it's time for this to become a thing. And I'm telling you, there's a strong angel to take us into the promises of God and to a time of harvest. This is a due season that we're in now. We're moving into a due season. And God is going to open the windows of heaven now, I want you to listen. God's going to open the windows of heavens. Angels will ascend and descend just like Jesus told Nathaniel. See, under the fig tree, wow, quite a word of knowledge. Jesus said, from this day forward, you'll see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, which means Jesus Christ was just declaring to Nathaniel, you are presently looking at the house of God in the gate of heaven. And God's looking for churches that will know the season that they're in. And those churches and those places will literally become the house of God and it will become the gate of heaven. Because God is all, uh, here, I'm, I'm too much. The first thing God created was what? The heavens and the earth because God has always intended the earth, the horizontal, and the heaven, vertical, to be in alignment. That your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. And when God finds those churches that come in alignment with him, they're moving into that season. They come in alignment with what God wants to do in that season. Trust me, those churches become a gate. And it flows through them and it flows into the world. 
And so the revival and the harvest that God intends to give you is not just for bro bridge. Well, we're just interested in bro bridge. I, you should be. It's your responsibility to be and have a burden for this. But the revival that God's going to give and has already been giving is going to flow out. And it's God intent. It is God's intent for this church to become a place of tremendous resources. I felt that and known that's been prophesied by I don't know how many. But it's when we come to that season. See, some people get disillusioned because, well, we keep hearing y'all talk about this stuff, but we're going to keep talking about it. <laughs> and we're going to keep praying about it until we come to that intersection. Well, my God, y'all been talking about financial blessings and resources, and we're in a pandemic, and oh, I guess. The only way God can take care of you is a certain president, president or certain parties. And my God shall supply all of your need according to the party that's in power. My God shall supply all of your need according to the Dow Jones and the stock market and the housing market. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in. So we move into seasons. <coughs> we move from an old season into a new season. We're transitioning. We've come to the intersection of it. And somebody today needs to wake up spiritually and say, I'm not going to miss what God told me he's going to do. I'm going to be at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Let's praise him now. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Jesus name Jesus name Jesus name Jesus name Jesus name Jesus name I want, you, I, want you, I want you to hear something. I have no doubt that God's called us to do work in Asia and China and now some other places. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, my God, it looks like the door's closed there. I mean, we can't get, matter of fact, Brother Caleb, he's not even living in China right now. He's living in, living in Singapore. He just the other day was allowed to go back in. So he goes, he went back in and visited the, the whatever. And uh, I'm looking at all that like, God, what in the world? How's this supposed to happen? My biggest deal has been this in the last few weeks. Lord, you know, because I hear all these people. Now, let me just open up here a second. I hear all these people. Oh, I'm telling you right now, man, this thing's about to get bad. They're going to destroy the economy, and everything's going down, and we're headed to one world this and one world that. And, and I mean, I, you know, and we listen to all that stuff. And I had a guy tell me the other day, I'm telling you right now, man, we get into January, it's going to get bad. If you're not careful, fear will overwhelm you and cause you to freeze. You won't move toward the season. You'll freeze right where you're at. You're terrified to move. I don't know. I don't know how it's all going to happen. You know, I'm looking at all this. I'm like, okay, God. How are we going to do this if the economy collapses? 
Pharaoh took everything except the land of the priest. He could not take their territory. And we're up against the spirit of Pharaoh. Listen, I mean, I'm just being realistic. I mean, my God, the government's about to take everything you got. We're going to keep adding taxation and taxation. Come to the state of California if you want to talk about taxes. We've got major corporations leaving. We've got people bailing out of California. There is a mass exodus because they just keep raising the taxes. And you all about to find that out if certain people go into office. We're about to give you a good taste of San Francisco politics. And you look at all this and you're like, oh my God, what in the world are we going to do? All I know is that when we move into these seasons, if we'll keep moving forward, it's up to God. But I just still feel like there'll be unprecedented resources. I mean, boy, when the pandemic first started, I was like, oh, boy, we're fixing to. I mean, we may have had a little dip, but. I mean, we've lost a few folks. A few folks have had to move and all that stuff and all the stuff going on. And now we got all this stuff. But you know what? I just have to believe, okay, God, you said that these things would happen. And we've got to get our eyes off of the problems in our promised land and focus on the promise giver. And if God said this is going to happen, it doesn't matter what's happening out there. God is positioning us right now. I'm, I've gone too far. He's positioning us right now to move into some promises and to move into stuff and all. That's all I know to tell you. I also know that somehow he's going to raise people up in this hour. I, 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 just, I just really believe that. I'm not trying to figure it all out, but I just believe that God's going to raise people up in this hour that are for this purpose and this reason. He's going to bless them. Not so they can make that something permanent for themselves and build bigger houses and more of this and more of that. But what he's going to do is, I'm going to do this because I, my people are going to move. Now, unless God's got a different plan, it's still going to take some finances to move the gospel. And that's where we're coming to. We're getting ready to take cities. We're getting ready to take nations. So let's find those seven seats. Brother Barnes said there's seven seats of Satan around the world. Seven different places that Satan has a seat, authority, and power. I, I remember a couple of them, two or three that he spoke. One of them was New Orleans. And boy, when you start talking about New Orleans, there's a fear that comes to people. Oh my God, it's darkness there. And either it's true, greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world, or it's not true. Another one was San Francisco, L.A., San Francisco, that part of California. Seats of Satan, where he sets up an authority as government. This is where he, and God says, at your promised land. And I'm going to send an angel. And we get so focused on the demons that we're like the prophet's servant. Oh my God, what are we going to do? And the old prophet that was going blind prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Ooh. I'm gonna, I, ooh. I was looking at this the other day and I said, God, he said, I am the Lord of hosts. Now look at that word, not the Lord of hosts, but the Lord of hosts. It's plural. So I got to look at that. I said, 
And it literally means down to the atoms. I can use the atoms to fight for me. I can use all of creation. It's not, when we say hosts, it's not just angels. It's all of creation. That's why when he talks about Cicero, he said, even the stars and the rivers fought against you because I am the Lord of hosts. And if I need to use a star or a river and an angelic host or an atom, it doesn't matter. I can use all of that. I feel all of that. It's a, that's a part of my army. And here we are as the church wondering, how are we going to do it? I got news for you. He's the Lord of the host. He can use any part of creation. Anything that he's created, he can use it. I feel him in the building right now. I said, I feel him in the building right now. I don't know what's warring against you, but you need to get a revelation. He is the Lord of hosts, and God can use a lot of things to war for you and to battle for you. Get your eyes off of the problem. Somebody ought to praise the Lord of hosts here today. No, we're going to pray. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. He will arise as a man of war. Let God arise and your enemies be scattered. Woo! Hallelujah! 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 Pharaoh, I'll turn rivers into blood. I'll send frogs. I'll send lice. I'll send darkness. I got a great army. All of this is at my disposal when I go to dealing with the spirit of Pharaoh. Elijah, I want you to go give a message to Ahab. And Ahab said, as sure as the Lord God before whom I stand, God is about to use the weather and the elements to fight against you and Jezebel. And we're getting ready to move into places just like this to where God says, I want you to speak it, I want you to decree it, I want you to declare it, because all of that is a, is a part of the host, a part of, that, of my whole war strategy. I'm going to use a lot of stuff in this end time and the church needs to wake up to it and quit thinking we're so weak and anemic because we serve the Lord of hosts and he's got all of that at his disposal and he knows how to use the weather and the elements and creation and atoms and rivers and stars and an angelic host. How in the world could you lose with a God like that? Let's praise him one more time. i got to stop. Let's praise him one more time. I mean, throw your hands in the air and decree me. You need to start saying it right now. He's my Lord of hosts. He's my Lord of hosts. He wars for me. He's got all of this at his disposal. Woo! Praise God. Praise God. You can use all of creation. You can use all of creation. You are the creator of the world. It's all at your beckoning command. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We appreciate your attendance. We would like to invite you to tune in with us weekly and share your worship service experiences with someone else on Facebook or YouTube. Also, for other anointed and inspirational clips, you can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter. If you would like to give, please follow the links below for further instructions. 
We pray that the Lord would bless you and strengthen your home this week. We thank you for worshiping with us and we invite you to worship with us again in our next service.